Um, Sorry, yeah, the volumes should be controlled there, but oops, it looks like it's working. Uh, okay, yeah. Maybe so our little lovely owl just hooted, so I'm assuming it's now we're on the track. Can people hear online? Okay, let's uh, take it away. Right. <laughs> Apologies for any. Uh, well, thanks to meet everybody. And thanks for taking time on your evening to come uh, hear a little bit about Biden. It's privilege to be down here in Calgary and talk to your folks. So the talk takes about 40 minutes, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you have about um, any aspect of life ecology. Uh, you'll be stimulated getting lots of your questions once the talk is finished. I'm sure this thing works. Now that's not working. Was it working before? Yeah. It doesn't work. We will have to read the Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Next slide, please. <laughs> Technology three. Yeah, it works. Oh, I can't resist. Well, hopefully, maybe in the back corner over there. Mr. Matt, she's my lovely wife. And without her, I'd just be a talking head up here. Kudos to her for the photographs. Yes. Yes. Will folks in the audience from the gallery or can you see the travel in from the way? Oh, there we go. Uh, so, the talk will focus on the historical distribution of planes and wood in North America. Um, next. Slide. Maybe just keep clicking, there'll be a bunch of text from there. Um, just just a second where I'm sorry. Where is that beautiful photograph? That's a young girl of Bison Bowl that's crossing the Lamar River Valley in Yellowstone. Uh -huh. Just a little anecdote while we get started on this. Um, the talk is about plains and wood bison, but there's actually a third type of bison that it early explorers referred to as the mountain bison. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's sort of a cross in its appearance and careful patterns and behavior between the plains and the wood. Mm -hmm. And I think that the origin of the mountain bison is actually just north of it, mm -hmm. Edmonton, along the North Saskatchewan River Valley. That's the area of rangeland overlap uh, between the two subspecies. Plains bison would move north into the Aspen Park line, wood bison would move south. And then they retract away during the breeding season, but some escape and they hibernate and create a, a, a mix of cross fertilizer. But then travel into the Rocky Mountain chain and all the way down to the Yellowstone and Grand Details. And the early people that passed through there remarked consistently about how different these animals were from the plains of the big popping in by the millions. And so we'll talk about how they affect the ecosystems they live in, who they share the landscapes with. And some examples of the species that are influencing by Boston. So, this is a, a complex map that was produced by Joel Allen in 1876, and it shows the contraction. Can we dim the lights a little bit? That... No. It shows the contraction of the rain from 1800 uh, through to the end of the Bison era. Next slide. You can just keep clicking through the numbers. Uh, but you can see the colors on the map. The colors correspond to those years. In 1885, the last free roaming wild bison were restricted to Yellowstone. 23 wild bison were all was left in all of North America, hiding mm -hmm. in the upper headwaters of the Pelican River Valley. And at the same time, around 1900, there were about 200, 250 wood bison left in and near what's now the Buffalo Mushroom Park. So we came. Within minutes of losing these guys completely. <laughs> this is a really complex map. You don't need to put, pay much attention to it. Um, but these folks um, classified all the ecoregions in North America. Next. And they classified 116 of them. I went through all 116 uh, trying to figure out whether or not Biden occupied those ecoregions. Next. Uh, and Figured out that they occupied at least 46 of the eco regions at once in conference in North America. Predominantly, the Great Plains was the main one. Next. And so, examples of these ecosystems, you can just slowly switch through each to the next. Uh, Wood Buffalo National Park, it's a group of young bulls. Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary, just pause there for a second. Um, in 1905, 196, uh, we're at the smallest part of the wood bison population in North America. 
After it began to recover, there was a population just outside or in the very northwest corner of Woodbelt National Park called the Yarling River, the Needle Lake, and Bison Population. The Canadian Wildlife Service was flying surveys there in 1957, and they found this population that nobody knew about it prior to it. was isolated and remote. And so they went in there because there was a major anthrax outbreak moving westward through the park. And these guys were going to be at risk of dying from anthrax. So they captured that population, about 200 animals, put them in a, a breeding facility and a holding facility. And they came and established the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary along the highway going to Yellowman, and 23 of them came south to Elk Island in 1965. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the animals that is um, in the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. Next. They made it into the Great Salt Lake from mm -hmm. Utah. This is Temple mm -hmm. Island State Park. On the far shore of the Great Salt Lake, the city is just to the left for a short distance. There's a cave in that, in that slope. Just or they're called promontory caves. And in the back of that cave, it's been occupied by humans for well over 6,000 years. Uh, they found this huge midden pile of moccasin plants. It's their garbage pond with leather primarily from bison mm -hmm. um, And when they looked at the construction technique of these moccasins, they were clearly of Denny origin. Mm -hmm. and the people from Northern Alberta moved south into uh, Utah set up shop of voluntary caves, and they eventually gave rise to the Navajo and the, the Apache. Mm -hmm. And next. Uh, Camp Rock Canyon State Park in Texas is sort of in the middle of the panhandle. Uh, this was one of the last free ranging wild bison populations of what's known as the Southern Herd. Charles Goodnight and his wife Mary went in there and captured the last members of that population, raised them in captivity, and eventually Cap Rock Canyon State Park was formed around those centers. Next. Sorry, Wes, a couple people online are having a try to hear it. So we're just putting the microphone slightly closer to you. Next slide. The well, plains made it all the way down into the northern um, oak savannas of Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, they were through Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, mm -hmm. all the way up the East Coast, with the exception of New York State. Next. Uh, has anybody been in the tall grass prairie in the United States? Uh, it's, if you think of the Great Plains, it borders the eastern perimeter of the Great Plains and extends right up into southern Manitoba. It's called the, the tall grass prairie because plants like big blue stem and little blue stem and rice grass will grow two meters tall. It's an incredibly lush, productive landscape. A lot of people know that at one point there were about 30 million bison in the North American plains. At the same time, there's 36 million elk, something that most people don't realize, and 32 million fawn. Incredibly rich landscape in the tall grass prairies, critically important in, in maintaining those populations. Next. Of course, they made it down the Rocky Mountain chains I just mentioned. This is the Grand Tetons, just to the south of Yellowstone. Next. The Aspen Parkland, and this is in Prince Albert National Park, which is very similar to Elk Island National Park here in Alberta. Next. The bulk of the talk is going to focus on the northern mixed grass prairie in and around Grasslands National Park in southern Saskatchewan. I had the opportunity to establish that population there in 2005. Mm -hmm. and we took 71 animals there, and they were held in a captive facility until the spring of 2006. And then the gates were open, and they've been free ranging ever since. Mm -hmm. and the next. Mm -hmm. and this is um, the northern mixed grass prairie. This is the Cypress Hill and Grasslands straddles the border right there. Very uh, interesting part of it. Has anybody been to Grasslands? Yeah, there's a few people. Shame on the rest of you for not being there. <laughs> it's a fantastic place to hear about chance. Next. So that's what it looks like there. You don't think of Saskatchewan as having that kind of topography in it. This is the French and River Valley. It flows from the Cypress Hills. Eastward, you went into the Missouri River drainage and eventually Mississippi. 
North of the French route, we're looking north of the border now. Um, the Cordillera ice sheets, or pardon me, the continental ice sheets, the Laurentide ice sheet that came from the north melted uh, and retreated northwards, north of the French route, leaving behind long linear meltwater channels of open miles. South of the river, in the foreground, the Cordillera ice sheets have moved east from the Rockies, melting in situ, just gone straight down and left behind this complex small and kettle topography, creating an incredibly diverse landscape that's perfect for bison and for people. That square block duke in the middle has over 200 tiki rings on it, <laughs> and some parts of the park they date back over 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. So you can sit down in a spot where you know somebody lived and ate their dinner and did their stuff 6,000 years ago. It's a pretty remarkable thing. There's 12,000 archaeological sites just within this part of the park, it's incredibly rich archaeological history. Next. So how to buy some impact ecosystem? It's a very clear example. Groundhetic coverage. Groundhetic coverage were originally restricted to the Gulf states, primarily Texas. And it was only after the extirpation of bison and the start of the big cattle drive that brought Texas longhorns <laughs> north of things like the Chisholm Trail in the southern Saskatchewan that the cowbird began to expand its range mm -hmm. as a male and a female. Next. <laughs> so the, the impact the ecosystems in three different ways. Next. The first is through their physical disturbance on the landscape. Interesting, if you have a chance to look at our book later, this is the cover, this is the photograph of the press barn to put on the cover. <laughs> we resisted that. <laughs> it's, it's in the PowerPoint because he's urinating on the prairie. <laughs> Directed back. Yeah. Next. Uh, bison trails. <clears throat> when grasslands was established first in 1987, when one of the local ranchers decided to retire, and he sold, I think it's about 70 square miles of his ranch land to the park. And the park management at the time decided that as soon as they acquired a ranch, they'd remove all the cattle from, take down all the internal fencing, get rid of all the old farmsteads and ranch headquarters, and leave the land vacant without a good justification for doing it. But when they did that, for the first time in thousands of years, there were no large hoof mammals like bison or cattle on the landscape that could punch a trail through the deep winter snowpack. And as a result, a whole host of other species began to suffer because they couldn't follow those old trails in. <laughs> Next, <clears throat> bison manure or patties is a pretty significant impact. An average bull like he will drop 10 to 12 of these a day on the landscape. This one was used as, by a robin with the listing post where she hunted her insects around it. Next. <clears throat> As wallows, we'll get into these in a lot more detail. It's one of Joanna and I's favorite things to look at when we're up on the bison refuge. Next. Past grazing. If there's, been, if there's a new bison population being established or supplemented somewhere, it's that bison grazing pattern that is driving the, the justification for it. It's incredibly important for grassland ecology. Next. As it's this I mean, simple, fancy word for footprints driven in its place, but it has such huge significance for that landscape and for other landscapes. For example, I, I had the opportunity to take a herd of wood bison into central Siberia, <laughs> belly of a Russian cargo plane, 36 <laughs> <kind of> flight. <laughs> because you know, he decided that he wanted to create Pleistocene National Park. <laughs> Because it's proven that the seed bank from the end of the plant, 10,000 years ago, is still viable in, in its heat, in its oil, and mm -hmm. in the permafrost. And it's a permafrost environment, a step under landscape. And he's shown mm -hmm. uh, Canada's now given 120 uh, wood bison to, to destroy it. And there, it, those 120 bison are already converting up this edge permafrost environment into a dry step grassland environment, mm -hmm. much like grasslands or inner Mongolia. Just in a matter of 15, 20 years. Mm. And it's because of the way that the bison hoop is sharper on the edges, it's terrified to boil better, causes those seeds to germinate. Mm. Next. And of course, you know, you're um, farming and rubbing of trees is a, a really critical one. Uh, these guys, Campbell et al., they postulated that it was the removal of massive birds of bison along the southern edges of the park, the park line. Aspen Parkland and the removal of fire from the agents burning that caused the Aspen Parkland to expand both southwards and westwards and connect to the Rockies. And that had implications indirectly 
uh, from the Northern Spot Valley along the West Coast. Because the bar devil, which was originally an eastern hardwood bird, was able to move its way through the Aspen Parkland, across the mountains, and into the uh, West Coast forest, the rain forest, where it's now competing in Northern Spot Valley, all because of the removal of bison historically from the landscape. Next. And some of the more direct relationships, you know, wolves and ravens have an unbroken relationship with the bison in, in Wood Buffalo National Park is the only place in, in North America where there was never a disconnect between wolves and ravens and other scavengers and predators. And so they've been going together. First bison set foot in that part of the world about 130,000 years ago. So it's been a long relationship. Next. This was in Yellowstone. We, we found this bison carcass that a board recently got killed. Eat that on her for a day and then buried her in a big deep debris pile. The next day, a, a saw grizzly with three yearling cubs came along and completely devoured that carcass in a matter of just a few hours. Mm -hmm. Next. And of course, one fast found there's carcasses on the landscape. And historically, with 30 million bison, even at an average mortality rate of 2 to 3%, that's literally tens of thousands of carcasses on the landscape every single year. And they contribute this massive pulse of nutrients into the ecosystem. And it's not happening anymore. Next. This is here in Elk Island National Park. They put a trail camera on a bull that had died during the breeding season, counted 18 different types that attended that park, and, uh, along with a whole host of birds and, of course, thousands of insects. Um, when a carcass like this occurs, and after it's been opened up, there's a mass invasion of flies that want to lay their eggs and larvae in that carcass. They do that in a very short period of time. So as a result, all those eggs hatch, uh, turn into larvae, and they all disperse from the carcass in a matter of the same length of time it took for the flies to arrive. So you get this massive explosion of larvae moving into the forest adjacent to it. And that attracts incomparable numbers of birds and insectivores. Next. And one of them is the sexton beetle. He's called a sexton beetle because, like the sexton in the church, he's responsible for burying the dead. And so these guys can sense a carcass, whether it's a mouse or a bison, from tremendous distance, and they'll fly uh, directly to it. The carcass gives off a, a, this invisible column of inorganic compounds that is detectable by insects from hundreds of meters away, if not more. So this guy flies in, they do the reproductive cycle. And then they go off in search of another carcass. But he's carrying a load of phreatic mites. Those little big guys around his shoulders are you know, the size of a pinhead. And they can't navigate from carcass to carcass. So they hitchhike on these guys and they'll get off, do their thing, and, and then hop back on the next one and come by and go off to the next carcass. Next. Some of the indirect relationships uh, facilitate grazing. Uh, and that's that patch grazing that I referred to earlier. It's a term that simply means that bison facilitate the ability of other herbivores to graze on the landscape. They create better conditions than what were there before. Next. And, and it's good for you can just pick through these your white tailed deer, not all cotton tail, mule deer, and the pronghorn antelope, black tailed prairie dog, which we'll get into a lot more. Um, has anybody had a chance to see a nuttles or a mountain cotton tail? And they're a little wee tiny gappers. If you've been to grasslands, you, you might see them. They're really cute. Uh, next. Some of the broader food web relationships. The grasshoppers, for example, uh, 77 different species have been imported just within Grasslands National Park. That biomass of grasshoppers alone is enough to sustain virtually every coyote, swift fox, red fox in the park, let alone all the other insectivores that are passing through or resident to it. It's a tremendous biomass in, uh, in grasshoppers. It's also one of the last places in North America where the North American locusts survived. Mm. North America is now the only common except Antarctica that doesn't have locusts. Uh, Microtines, small mice, uh, moles. This is the western jumping mouse. And, uh, the three foxes, the foot fox, red fox, and coyotes, and both predators and scavengers. Um, we'll talk more about this nest coming up, but it's a squirrel nest woven entirely out of bison hair that they picked off the carcass uh, in the Yukon. Next. 
here the completely functioning ecosystem just in that one footprint. Uh, so Arn Mark had uh, found this bison footprint and she woke the, her nest in the bottom of that entirely out of bison hair that she picked up off the landscape. Mm -hmm. Laid two of her eggs in there and then brown heavy cowbird came along and terrified <laughs> and left two of her eggs in there. <laughs> so a completely functioning ecosystem just within that one footprint. Next. And shed bison hair, we'll talk a lot more about. It's the second warmest natural fiber in all of North America, next only to the musk oxen, idiot. And tremendously important for grassland species. Next. And it's all because of the way that bison uh, graze that landscape. Next. So that's what grasslands look like now. And the park, as I mentioned, we've got 71 animals, 30 male and 30 female calves, and 11 female yearlings. We held them in confinement uh, until the following spring, and then they were released. And the park has reached a population of, they're capping the population at 500. And they've achieved that several times now. Mm -hmm. And every two years, they go in and remove surplus animals uh, above that. Uh, mostly, they go to First Nations lands to help them bring bison back to their cultures. Um, so that's what the park looks like now. Very dynamic landscape. So who do they share it with? Now, there's a corn bar that I mentioned. There's 26 species of endemic grassland birds uh, in that region. Okay. Nine of those are considered to be all the grassland birds that you won't find in another ecosystem. Next, that's these guys here. Every one of these species is in decline across North America, is our most grassland birds. Since 1970, there's probably been a 50 to 60 percent decline of every one of these species, and, and some of them up to 90 percent. Uh, so, having bison back on that landscape is directly influencing the ability of every one of these uh, to rebound. Since the bison were released, we've had a lot of college and university students, postgraduate research happening there, where they do surveys outside the park on agricultural lands and inside the park adjacent to it. And every one of these species is beginning to improve in abundance and distribution now that the bison are back inside the park, but they're not outside the park. Next. Now there's 35 mammal species. And these are you know, black tailed prairie dogs. I guess those who haven't been to um, grasslands probably haven't seen a black-tailed prairie dog. You can still do that here in Alberta. Uh, some places in here are elderly enough, like myself. I remember Al Owings game farm outside of Edmonton. He's the only place uh, outside of the southern Alberta Saskatchewan with prairie dogs. He established his own colony there years ago. So if you're up towards Edmonton and Sherwood Park, you can see them there. Next. Uh, of these 35 species, about a dozen are obligates. Next. And there's a sampling of it. Black footed parrot's an interesting animal. The grasslands, actually, we'll leave that for a moment. If you've ever been out on the short grass prairie in a cold moon night and you hear this high fish howling like somebody's got a coyote by the tender bit, <laughs> it's this grasshopper mouse. He howls, sits upon his hind legs and howls just like a miniature coyote. <laughs> and they're true predators. They don't eat seeds like other species do. They eat just grasshoppers and other insects. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. um, this is a neat relationship that um, I find just fascinating. I tried to get Joanne to go closer. Oh. <laughs> she was at a safe distance with a good teleport lens. <laughs> Next. So see, these are some of the important uh, amphibians and reptiles in cut. Nobody knows yet where the yellow belly racer nests or whether or not they produce live young or from eggs. And we suspect it's because they're they're then in northern pocket gopher burrow systems in subterranean burrows where um, researchers just haven't been able to find them. The plains garter snake photograph is from a hibernaculum. Actually, an old badger uh, den along the side of the slope. And these guys have come out of the badger den and crawl up into the upper branches of some shrubs, thermoregulate first thing in the morning, and catching the first rays of sun, and then disperse off for their, for their foraging. The greater shorthorn lizard is an endangered species in Canada. It's at the very northern tip of its range. It's no bigger than the tip of my thumb, it's virtually invisible unless you get to lay the move. And we'll talk more about the toads coming up. Next. So how do they influence, uh, how do they do all this magic? Next one. 
Here's a good example of two brown ant cowbirds foraging around insects that are disturbed by this presence. There is a, a wonderful series of photographs captured by a photographer in Anvil Biome State Park in Utah. A very desert, dry landscape, and no freestanding open water with the exception of man made features. Uh, so, very arid. And he's got a wonderful series of photographs of the cowbirds. Every time a bison would lift its head, there's a little bit of drool of mucus, and they fly up there and lick that stuff off the nose of the bison mm -hmm. uh, to get the moisture. But it's also incredibly rich in microbes. So, they're getting protein from that as well. Next. Uh, all of this uh, grazing activity leads to enhanced habitat for other wildlife, like the pronghorn. Now, these guys were <coughs> disappeared from the park region when the cattle were removed from the landscape during the winter months. And now birds are staying right through the winter now that they have access to those bison trails. Next. And this is why I just mentioned in the book my favorite part of grassland ecology. Uh, the whole ecology of Grasslands National Park and the Great Plains in general starts with this. Next. I love this sign. <laughs> Next one. And that microbiome, the, the snot that a bison produces, is incredibly important to the whole ecosystem uh, and the animal itself. Without bison snot, uh, they're not able to digest the food that they eat. Because, uh, next slide. These guys are grazing uh, throughout that grassland ecosystem, but their face is constantly buried in vegetation. They have the largest lung capacity of any North American mammal. Huge. We've got a trachea that's twice the size of a bee pen. So, massive insuck of air every time they take a breath. When they're doing that, they're inhaling microbes that are on the vegetation, on the soil surface, in the crust of the pile. All that gunk gets hung up in the nasal vestibules of the bison. Next slide. Next. Next. And periodically, you'll see this cattle doing it as well. They'll lift their heads up and foraging about. And give a quick flick to each, no each nostril to clean all that accumulated gunk out of there. That, of course, then gets swallowed, mixed in with the food that they're chewing at the time in their cub, and it enters the room, first of their four stomachs. Next. These microbes are absolutely essential for all herbivores like these guys to break down the fibrous vegetation that they're eating. Next. Next. So here's a, a schematic of a license room. <coughs> It's about, uh, my apologies for using pounds, but uh, it's about 45 uh, gallons in, in, in volume. It's a massive thing. Next. Uh, so when the, the animal swallows the bowls of food that he's eating, it enters the rumen. And the rumen essentially is just a big fermentation bath. It's identical to our compost bin, it's the kind that you roll in your backyard to mix and churn and, and break down with the vegetation, the fibers that are in your compost. It does exactly the same thing. So the fungi arrive and they break down the starch, the bacteria can digest it. The bacteria in turn break uh, next, uh, digest the sugars and proteins and fiber, and then along comes the protozoa, <coughs> these two other groups of animals. So you've got a completely functioning predator prey ecosystem functioning just within the room. And the protozoa are major predators, and in their bellies, they'll have literally millions of bacteria and fungi. Next. And the whole system is designed to break down the food so that these guys can digest it. And of course, it passes through the digestive system and throughout the, the other three stomach and large intestine and out on the landscape. Next. So here's the protozoa macroscopically. <laughs> these guys are the equivalent of a blue whale swimming through the ocean. <laughs> <hunting trail. laughs> that kind of size comparison. <laughs> Next. And as I mentioned, what goes in must come out. And in Joanne's case, next, it lands in a very full again. <laughs> in this bison patty is another completely unique and functioning ecosystem with its own guild of predators and prey. It's an incredibly vibrant landscape component. Next. So to help, try to help people understand just how dynamic it is, I put together this series of Graphs, I guess you call it. So the fungi, bacteria, and protozoa arrive with the dung when it lands on the landscape. Next. And within minutes, literally within minutes, uh, these three are hunted by a whole host of other uh, insects and flies and uh, everybody else that is called Coprophilus insects. Next. And they in turn are preyed upon by a whole host of other uh, predator beetles and flies and wasps. On average, uh, 
A bison patty like that can have up to 300 different species uh, attended. And at any one time, there can be 100 species feeding off of a bison patty and up to 1,000 individual insects just on one bison patty. Okay. So when you think of the biomass of insects you're, which are produced just from bison patty, it's counting. These guys, of course, dung beetles are, are one of the ones that they the most critical role historically. Although this guy, what is from the period of the European import, they were able to figure out that he arrived in North America on a full load of cattle from Britain in 1897 mm -hmm. in a harbor in Boston. Mm -hmm. And it's traveled across North America now and it's probably one of the most ubiquitous dung mm -hmm. beetles you can find. Next. Now, these guys don't hunt uh, the bacteria, for the, they don't actually eat the dung. They're looking for bacteria in the protozoa, not that it's in the dung itself. <clears throat> so they're flying through uh, an oxygen rich environment, and crawling on the ground to a fresh dung pad, which they can sense from a tremendous distance. When they fly there, they land splat headfirst into this waste anaerobic environment, no oxygen in that thing at all. <laughs> so they immediately then hold their breath and they stir around punching holes in the oxygen agent. The dung pad. That then allows other insects to colonize it and begin to occupy it. Next. I did this drawing to help people understand the three guilds of dung beetle ecology. The rollers are the ones we often think about the classic dung beetle on the front legs rolling a dung ball. Uh, they'll take a meal or a root ball out of the dung pad and then roll it. Away from the dunk out with one egg in it. They're the only insect on the planet that uses celestial navigation in its reproductive cycle. Pretty quite amazing. And they go, they want to go in a straight line rather than wandering aimlessly away from the dunk out. So they use the full moon, and if the full moon is not there, they use the Milky Way and they move, navigate towards it. Pretty quite amazing. The dwellers, the little red guy, the Apodius cemeterius, is a dweller. The females will burrow into that dunk out to create a brood chamber. And within that, create individual brood balls, each with one egg in it. And then there's two groups of uh, tunneling beetles, the fast burying and the mm -hmm. different ecologies all together in a whole suite of different um, uh, dung beetle species. Um, these females will burrow down through the soil, depending on the soil type, up to a meter. And that's incredibly important because they're taking that manure down and that deep, but they're also creating infiltration channels for the water to penetrate deep into those grassland roots. And then along come long belt curlews and the countless long spurs that pick off the stray ones. Next. This is two, uh, the roller uh, dung beetle, can't find the lyrics. It's fighting, two females are wrestling over a, a brew ball at one of the created on a bison farm in southern Alberta. We watched them tussle for one and then one of them actually won and took off. <laughs> As I mentioned, one dung pack can sustain over 100 insect species. Next, thousands of individuals. There's one study that showed that one bison cow can, just from the insects that she produced from her own dung, uh, that equates to a quarter of her body mass every year in, in weight of insects. So that fascinated me. Next. Um, so I wanted to know what the <laughs> Million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Next. And so I took William Hunter's population graph. He did this population graph from 1861 to 19, or 1889, showing the decline of plains bison you know, through the slaughter period. And then, based on that, I estimated, based on the core of the body mass of an individual bison, how many insects that it put into. And it's 300 billion insects every single day on the landscape. And by the 1880, late 1880s, all of that resource was gone from the landscape. So every insectivorous bird, every amphibian and reptile that depended on that food bread base were suddenly starving. There just wasn't the food that for them. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> directly affect the grassland ecosystems, nice young cow. Next. It starts in the winter. Because most often, if a new population is being established, the bison arrive in mid to late winter. The receiving agencies want to have them as close to the end of the winter as possible to reduce their feeding costs and that sort of thing. So when they're out on the land, they're creating these foraging patches, cratering in the snow. And those bison, unlike horses or elk, or, or, they paw with their front feet to get through. They use their noses and the bridge of their nose to, to sweep that snow away. 
And that's what you're seeing here. Next. And that's what it looks like in the spring. So when they're done creating that foraging bug, they're left with a patch of grass that's close to the ground within a power stand of undisturbed grass. And that patch of grass gets the most sun, most moisture, and is the first to start growing in the spring. Next. That's that same patch of grass where it's been grazed and where it hasn't been grazed. <clears throat> This is exactly like us mowing our lawns. You great you mow it on Monday and you gotta get back out there and cut it again on Wednesday. Well, that grass that's growing that quickly is, is the most succulent, most digestible, most nutritious, and it's what every herbivore in the landscape wants to eat. They'll avoid that tall stuff as long as they can to get this freshly grazed material. And that's what drove the migration pattern. The whole ecology of Isaac historically was the search for and the regrazing of formerly grazed patches of grass. <laughs> And it kept up like that right through the summer months and right into the peak of the breeding season, which is the middle of July, the middle of August. Um, and then after the middle of August, the grass is cured and they don't have that new growth anymore. That's time perfectly to fracture the math of rutting aggregations, herds of thousands of animals that would get together at the peak time of forage production. And as soon as the grass is cured, those massive herds would break up into smaller and smaller groups and disperse all over the landscape again. And that's the point where First Nations people actively sought them and hunted them because they were achievable. They could take a herd of 50 and, and slaughter them over a cliff or something. Herd of 10,000, we couldn't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. So it's all tied to that grazing mm -hmm. Next. This is the helicopter shot looking down at the grasslands in Grasslands National Park. And you can see just from the color variation of vegetation how complex that is. And that's strictly because of the way the bison had graced the landscape. It wasn't like that before the bison arrived. Next. And some of those interspecies relationships. Here's a couple <coughs> non native ones, European starlings on bison, mm -hmm. and they're better than a stand with crested wheatgrass. Crested wheatgrass was brought into North America from Siberia in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing plant for stabilizing drifting soils. Which is why it was brought in to put an end to the dust bowl area. But it's also very invasive. Farmers planted it, it makes a good early spring forage and a moderately good bale hay, not very good. Mm -hmm. It's common in and around uh, farm sites in grasslands, uh, all across the northern plains. And grasslands has a very rigorous program of eliminating it and putting it back into uh, a more of a native uh, mix. Next. So to help people understand uh, what happened in, in 1987 to 19, uh, mid-1990s, this is what happened. It's still a diverse grassland, but there's no forbs, there's no flowering plants, they're all fibrous rooted grasses, there's no uh, cap roots in there. And this is a function of reduced grazing intensity. Mm -hmm. Grasses don't compete forbs in a good amount of time. So it's still diverse, lots of different species. But not as diverse as a natural bathroom. Next, we put bison back on the landscape. Uh, and bison grazed the landscape completely differently than cattle. Tremendous amount of research has shown that um, people used to think that cattle could be a surrogate for bison on great plains if you put them back because they've got the same stomach structure, that sort of thing. But they're truly not. They graze the landscapes completely differently. And as bison graze it, they'll create those grazing walls, patches that you know, cattle won't do. Unless they're very intensely forced to do it like that. Next, the plants, the grasses can't sustain that level of grazing in those small patches forever. And eventually, the roots of those grasses become depleted and they're replaced with flowering plants. Plants with <coughs> tuberous roots. The one in the, um, this one is a winter pack. It's called winter pack because cattle actually gain fat on it during the winter months. Most grassland plants are down to. 8 to 10 percent through protein and by midwinter, this will carry 22 percent right through spring. Mm -hmm. Incredibly valuable. Next, once we've had bison back on that landscape, that whole intermediate intermixing variables compound to create an incredibly diverse landscape. Lots of thick tuberous root, tuberous roots, uh, species like the 13 line ground squirrel, which didn't exist there for many years, have returned along with a, a really healthy and vibrant insect population. 
Next week. <laughs> this is the one that's got me. Most people consider the northern poppy broker, a lot of people call them moles, but they're not. Uh, is a pest. Uh, agricultural take them in their pastures and their grain fields. And, you know. But from an ecosystem point of view, they're incredibly important. <laughs> they're known for burrowing underneath the soil and building those earth and mounds above the ground. There was one study that showed it takes 3,500 times as much energy to walk one meter underground as it does one meter above. <laughs> Probably calculate that. <laughs> If you can't do that on grassroots, they must have the, the four rules to get the energy that he needs. Next, next. I went through the literature trying to find out who would benefit from Northern Parker Gopher Borough Systems, and this is just a very short list. Next, and I couldn't get it all on, on one slide. Well, over 30 species benefit directly from having that borough system, either for estivation during the summer months when it's too hot. Uh, for many of these species will hibernate in the rural systems. Tremendously important. Next. This is a, a fascinating series of events. Killing amazes me. These people went into museums across the desert southwest and they were looking for pickled snakes. <laughs> they were intact because they wanted to know what those snakes were eating. So they dissect them and get down into the colon and, and see what mice and bulls, insects, whatever was in there. And they discovered that as the they catch a mouse. Next. Oh, back up. Yeah, I go back. There. Next. So the sequence is that uh, a snake like this will be slithering through the grass somewhere near a bison like this. She's grazing on seeds. Those seeds she ingests. And we put radio collars on a bunch of bison there, and they walk on average about 10 kilometers a day from point A to point B, where they bed down. Next. Um, and like all bison do, they, they ruminate frequently. They'll bed down like this, perhaps 10, 15 kilometers away from where they consumed food in the morning. Next. And then they stand up. Of course, they leave a patty on the ground. That's full of the seeds that she ate that morning. Then along comes a dung beetle. Breaks that apart, takes those seeds and disperses them, and the whole new plant grows. Next. Yeah, you know, that's the next plant grows from dung beetle seeds. Next. <clears throat> now along comes this guy, an orange kangaroo rat or pocket mice. They both have you know, the whole guild of pocket mice. Their cheeks are lined with fur lined pouches that get quite distended. And they'll spend a tremendous amount of time foraging out across the prairie, collecting seeds from plants like the evening rice grass. They'll pack them with cheap pouches full of these seeds and then take them back to a central foraging cache. If a snake comes along, like a rattlesnake, and snags one of these guys uh, before they have a chance to sing out their cheap pouches, they're also injecting those seeds. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that over the course of the summer, a snake like this will take will eat between 12 and 20 pocket mice. Next. Mm -hmm. These guys, they put uh, chips in their, micro chips in their backs to see how far they would travel. And the same can travel quite a few kilometers every year from this Padanakan. Turns out that these guys don't have the ability to digest vegetative matter, <clears throat> only the meat, the tissues of the mouse they eat. So as they're digesting that mouse, the seeds that that mouse had in his cheek pouches are actually germinating inside the colon of the snake. And as the snake is slithering along the ground, next, yeah. um, it's depositing fully germinated seeds in an ideal rich medium, miles and miles away from where that bison cow captured that seed and perhaps years ago. And that, of course, benefits every other herbivore like the palm on, on the landscape. Next. So back to about shed bison here. As I mentioned, it's the second warmest natural bison here in North America. Next. And it sticks on every time. Mm -hmm. And bison have two hair coats, a long, dark, uh, thick, coarse hair on the outside, actually like a raincoat. And then this dense, uh, really incredibly dense uh, under fur. Mm -hmm. There was one study done at um, many berries years ago by the provincial government, the federal government, where they took um, perfect calves, yearling um, bison calves, and yak calves, and they they counted the numbers of hairs per square inch on, on each of those. 
tedious job. Uh, you know, on average, a yearling herder had 8,000 pairs per square inch. Why is it going to say came to 30,000 pairs per square inch? So incredibly dense. I don't remember, remember the number of react, but it was higher than in Catalan. Next. This is a, a net in Prince Albert National Park. And these are the dark uh, yard hairs that I mentioned. And then underneath that is the, the dense underfoot. There's been work done out of Oklahoma where they found that birds that use bison hair in their nests, it provides a bunch of benefits. One is olfactory masking. If the smell of the fur itself is strong enough to hide the smell of the eggs and the chicks from passing raccoons or foxes. Um, it's incredibly water repellent. So these wet spring storms that often hit the prairies, um, the chicks have a higher rate of survival, up to 30% more than a, a grass flying nest. Um, and it helps to shed you know, winter storms like or spring storms. Next. Again, like the pocket gopher, there's a very long list of species. If a bird lives in landscapes occupied by bison, you can pretty much be guaranteed uh, they've got bison hair in their nests. Next. <laughs> Joanne was out one spring in, in grasslands <laughs> in a region of the park that uh, the bison had only recently discovered, in, in particular, a couple of bulls living up there. And she saw this um, female Richardson ground squirrel <laughs> moving from the wall where the bull had uh, rolled and thrashed and shred some hair, making repeated trips uh, from the source to her underground burrow. And there hadn't been a bison on that landscape probably for 150 to 160 years. And how does she have that intrinsic knowledge, that instinctive knowledge that this fiber was beneficial to her and her young? Just blew, blew us away. She's obviously nursing. And she made next she made her repeated trips back and load after load back um, down into the borough system. I was involved in both of us were involved in the relocation of bison in the backcountry of Banff in 2017. And I had the opportunity to spend um, the rest of the winter um, at the site where the bison were maybe sitting on the feeding and watering all that. In the spring, when the snow left, the rich the Columbian grounds came up. And, and it was really a fascinating thing to watch the expressions on their faces. They went to bed in the landscape without anything on it. <laughs> surrounded by these big furry animals. <laughs> and they did exactly the same thing. <laughs> they were scrounging, picking them by the <laughs> Next. And by the walls are a pretty neat thing. Next. We have a habit whenever we're visiting a bison sanctuary of investigating who is there before us. Mm -hmm. We like to think of bison walls as the guest book of Prairie Society. Mm -hmm. Everybody leaves their signature when they come through a visit. Mm -hmm. There's 12 different mammal birds and purple dogs in this photograph alone. And in the background, there's a different shade of green. Every one of those are ancestral bison walls that date back hundreds of not probably thousands of years, some of them. And an old wall like that fills full of vegetation. And a new one obviously gets beat up pretty good in government. There's a recent publication showing that the, the insect populations within ancient walls compared to the vegetation beside it, compared to active walls, is completely different. They looked at three different fields uh, love, uh, sucking insects, uh, foraging insects with equal leafy material, and insects that were adaptable beneath the decaying vegetation. And those three were tremendously different inside and outside of ancient walls. Next. This is in Prince Albert National Park. Black bear and wolves in one wall, coyotes, insect birds. Tremendous when you go to visit these places. Next. And this is a fascinating one. Um, these are called vernal wetlands. Bison walls will fill up, active walls will fill up with water in the spring. We snow melt and rain. And then you can see the, the ancient walls all through the background that, that don't hold water because the vegetation sucks it up. Well, these water filled walls are incredibly important for a whole host of species. Next. Next. Toads. These guys, you can pick through three spade footed toad, the Canadian toad. Next. Next. And this, mm -hmm. the spade for the toad in particular, and that's their tadpole. They have the fastest metamorphosis of any uh, toad on the planet. These guys will hop into a 
wallow like that in the spring. Later, it is, and 10, 10 days later, up oh, to fully morphed at all. Incredibly mm -hmm. fast. Wow. fast. Wow. And it's time the length of time that that wallow is on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, the tadpole. <laughs> the tadpole. <laughs> The tadpole was born to be a, a herbivore. It'll swim around in that little bubble of water, eating on scum and vegetation. But as the water temperature decreases in depth, it also warms. And there's a critical temperature where the scum morphology of the tadpole changes from having sideways facing eyes, like all prey species, to having forward facing eyes, like all predator species. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that 10 day period, mm -hmm. the gull changes and they begin to hunt insects and other tadpoles mm -hmm. and recruit predators. And then within, you know, as I mentioned, 10 days, the puddle is dried up. They're hopping out across the landscape as fully marked adults. Imagine what it was like when there were 30 million bison in the landscape, and every one of those in ancient walls is a puddle of water is host of these species. And how they much, how much they were devastated by the decimation of bison and the extinction of all those old walls. Now I'd like to talk about animal. <laughs> how big are those toads? Oh, yeah, not like that. Yeah. Yeah. And the tadpoles? The tadpoles are in the side of my finger. So I was out in one spring doing a patrol and I came across these two pronghorn goats. It was one of those miserable spring days with on and off again, sleep, rain, snow, <laughs> pounding winds. Really quite a miserable day. I was in my truck nice and warm and I watched these uh, two for a few minutes. And I realized that the upper one had just given birth to twins. Oh, oh. Next slide. And from the moment that I came across her until uh, she stood up and the, oh, yeah. the bond stood up with her was maybe 10 or 15 minutes. They were still wet. Um, mm -hmm. They struggled to their feet after a few minutes and then she took them around the base of the slope and, and over my sight. So I struggled against the wind and I went to, and laid down right beside her that one in the ancient wall of this. And there wasn't a breath of wind. The wall was maybe this deep, with the air flowed over, like perfectly calm and warm in the bottom. Of it. And she had an instinctive and ancestral knowledge. And she may have been born in an ancient wall and knew that that was a good place to give birth. I love that kind of ancestral knowledge. Next. So, prairie dogs and bison have a millions long, tens of thousands of years long relationship. Next. 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 So here's a pretty classic scene in, in grasslands, very dogs in the foreground, you puddle of water and bison in the background. That's not a stone hand, it's one equivalent to some one side of a little bit or greater cloud and often they'll make the road. Next. Burrowing owls, of course, are an endangered species in Canada. Prairie dogs will build these burrows, they go down a long ways. And in the spring, the northern or Burrowing owls will arrive. Males first, they'll fly up from Mexico or wherever they overwinter. The male gets there first and he'll fly around and find, find an abandoned burrow, or one that's not occupied by the prairie dogs. And then he'll spend time foraging across the landscape, picking up dried buffalo chips, bringing it back to that abandoned burrow and decorating. He'll spend a tremendous amount of time decorating the top of that burrow system with his droppings and with scattered up bison droppings as a way to uh, say hey to the girls that are coming, look down here, I'm, I'm a pretty handsome dude and I can take care of it. And she'll see that and then she'll set up shop with him. And he'll continue to break up bison dung and bring it back and crack it up and take it all the way down into the machine chain. Well, she's down there greasing um, eggs and rearing those chicks. When the chicks hatch in the bottom of that burrow system, there's insects that follow that dung all the way down into the nesting chain. And those chicks learn to hunt the beetles that are on the dung well, in the security of their natal den. And then when they come up, there's a higher density of insects associated with that down around the door system. And it's really quite a nice relationship. And those are young of the year pups and very dogs. Next, this is a mountain plover. She's standing on a dry buffalo patty. They're a very endangered species in Canada. Next. 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 This is her nest. Uh, if I hadn't been walking across the landscape when she flushed out from underneath my feet, 
I almost spoiled my man package because it was just like <laughs> bursting from coming out of the ground. You couldn't see it, perfectly camouflaged. Next. Sage Gross, uh, we had the privilege of being in, in Montana, uh, where we had a, a really good viewing opportunity for Sage Gross. Sage Gross and, and next. Shark tails, both like on areas of short grass. They can't live or can't do the breeding ceremonies in tall grass vegetation. So those grazing patches and lawns that Bison are creating, which is what this is on the edge of a wall, um, are ideal places for these birds to return and conduct their breeding ceremonies. And in the southern part of the Grasslands National Park, where the sage grouse are, they're beginning to see an increase in numbers. I think historically they, they do like counts in spring and count 200 males. Uh, when we were working there, they were down to, I think it was two, mm -hmm. 13 birds altogether. They're coming back. Next. Fairy mm -hmm. uh, dogs and badgers and coyotes have a pretty fascinating relationship. Prairie dogs can't live in an environment with tall grass, so they're constantly pruning their cities, their towns back away to keep the predators visible. We, we know of three different uh, pairs of badgers and coyotes that are hunting cooperatively together, hunting prairie dogs. <laughs> These guys, the prairie dogs, create two different types of mounds. This is a domed mound, and in the background, this one, you should follow them back there. These are ribbon mounds. <laughs> Places where the prairie dogs built up a little volcano shaped cone. And as the wind flows across that landscape, they're connected underground. And they will circle around the top of that little volcano and then come back out into a dome pond. So these guys are just walking to walking from bakery to bakery still in the background. <laughs> and much, much, much good to eat here. Um, and they do clever things. We watched uh, on one occasion three badgers or three coyotes from sound asleep in a hot summer day. It's probably 35, 40 degrees, incredibly hot, and they're unconscious, flat on their sides, or so we thought. Every now and then you see an eyeball open up and they pay attention to the surrounding. Coming up wind from behind me was a badger, and every prairie dog in that column was focused on that badger, completely forgetting the presence of the <laughs> And then the, uh, at the last second, Kyra would leap to his feet and try to get an unwary prairie dog. One of them ran so hard, he was right on the tail of the prairie dog, and the prairie dog went into the burrow, followed by the coyote head. And it's a pretty neat next. And this is how the wind moves through uh, those prairie dog burrow systems. Constant relative humidity, uh, pretty neat uh, air conditioning system. Next. So it's fun to watch them. And this has been reported in the literature elsewhere uh, as well. Uh, there's cattle in the background. This is typical, typically happens with our bison. Next. In the Aspen Park, this is an Elk Island National Park, there's a pretty typical scene in the spring. That's what it looks like right now. Uh, a little bit more leafy. But this is typical Elk Island. Um, wetlands and bottoms of the pockets. Open grassy slopes, and forest, and then some larger ponds in the back of And bison will seek out these green slopes uh, right at this time of year and flourish heavily on it. Next. The bison have this habit to forage on those slopes, but then move back to the forest edge uh, in a shade to rest and do their cut, and then deposit another very charismatic dump path. The dump paths are in higher concentration adjacent to the forest edge than they are out in the open. Because that's where you can bed down. Next. I was out on a patrol one day years ago and I saw this young woman crawling around on her hands and knees in, in the middle of the meadow, intently looking at the ground. I, I couldn't figure out what she was up to, so I went over and asked her. Turns out she was a, a young woman from Finland doing her PhD on the slave making behavior of one ant species on another. Mm -hmm. A black ant would go to a red ant colony, snag a slave, and take it back. From it was served in the home colony. Next. <laughs> and in doing that, she was crawling around looking at these ants. She discovered that virtually every ant in the park had been, or every, every ant in the park was established by a queen on a buffalo pad. So as a result of that, there's a higher density of ant adjacent to the forest edge than there is out in the open. <laughs> Next. And that's important for these guys, the northern figure. They're primarily an ant-eating bird. They live in 
cavities that they created just inside one or along the forest edge. They'll fly out there and punch and ants and then take it back to feed their young. Next. Just click through these. Next. Next. And that's important for these guys. And Northern Flying Squirrel needs to have these nesting cavities. And it turns out that the flicker nest is the Goldilocks of nest cavities for flying squirrels. And Philly and Woodpeckers have one that's too big and downy and hairy and too small, but it's a perfect fit for the Northern Flying Squirrel. Next. It turns out these guys are putsy about which cavities they used and for what purpose. Next, they have some that are just for refugia, a place where they go to if a goshawk is passing through, they'll go to that one specific cavity. They have others that they use to rear their young in, and they have others that they use just for their toilet. And these ones are made because some of those nesting cavities can be up to a meter deep in some of the big old trees. So you get a meter of flying squirrel, flying squirrel down to build up in here. Next. And that's important for this guy. Can't pronounce it, but next. This guy, I don't know what we don't do. You know, four to 11 meal means long. The only place on the planet where you'll find it is on squirrel land. So if you didn't have license, and that sequence of events is all the way through, these guys wouldn't be able to exist. Next. So at the end of the slaughter, 1893, Frederick Gurner printed this, painted this painting. And that book must have been. The depressing death of the time on, on Great Plains, just the audience and the carcass being scattered. Next. And these folks took that um, painting a step further, came up with this analogy that ecosystems are like airplanes. You, know, you can have somebody crawling around inside there, uh, removing critical components, and that plane will continue to fly. Next. 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 That's the components. Now, this is the complete blueprint of all the bits and pieces that make that C1 and EC3 a functional ecosystem. And if somebody's falling through there removing those parts, it becomes less complicated, less diverse than any <laughs> that he get pulled out of a key component and the plane crashes. And the analogy is the same with ecosystem. You can have a completely functioning ecosystem, diverse and dynamic. And we as humans come along and we start monkeying with it, changing it, removing critical components until eventually you remove one or more keystone species and the ecosystem collapses. This plane is locally known as Miss Piggy. And mm -hmm. She crashed just outside the airport in Churchill, not because she was had some component removed, but because they overloaded her and she couldn't take off. Mm -hmm. And the same analogy applies then to ecosystems. We're constantly putting stuff on ecosystems and eventually they collapse. And that's what happened in Raskin National Park when the cattle were removed. We removed the key component of that ecosystem. Next. Put bison back on that landscape. Next. And suddenly you've got all of those critical components being returned to the ecosystem. Some of them directed to human intervention. But most of these will return to that ecosystem on their own, just keep having bison back on that landscape. Next. So you think back to this complicated map of 116 different eco regions, 46 of which have bison in them, and we only talked about this one little weak green patch. Imagine how complex North America was before we came along and messed it up. Next. Next. I think that's it. Next. So this is the conclusion. I give this talk a lot to bison producers across the US and Canada. 100% of the time, people are in the audience asking me, well, I don't have about six lives and I've only got 20. Can I play a role in, in returning ecosystem function to these landscape? And certainly, you think of grassland birds or migratory birds that are coming up from South America to the Arctic. They need places to refuel, stop over the plants. Yeah. And every one of those small managed bison populations is providing a host of benefits to those migrating birds. So it doesn't matter whether you're a Ted Turner. 55,000 head of bison or bob down the road with 12. Everybody contributes to the continental scale return of bison to the landscape. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Um, mm -hmm. I did this drawing uh, after I was in, involved in the bath program. 
I worked in back as a park warden in, in Dinlock, backcountry patrols up the Cascade River in the Panther Dormer Valley. And this uh, rock was just outside of a place called the Windy Warden Cabin. Uh, I sat on that rock, chewed my lunch on it, tied in for some people, treated it decided never paid it any attention. And then in 2017, we were with a, a Blackfoot elder from the Blood Reserve in Southern Alberta, New York, little bit. Amazing man. He was walking around there with his cell phone taking photographs. Uh, I saw him from a distance come running. The guy's 80 years old. And he's got this massive grin on his face. Yes, what do this? From his perspective, he saw dead bison. Mm -hmm. So I gave this ghostly bison, giving the, the old stone on a wake up call. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. So that's it. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. My name mentioned that we have a few books to present about their views of the environment. This talk is um, a very short introduction to what the book covers. Yes. I have three questions if that's your point. First of all, um, with the, the dung beetles, is there a particular species that has kind of recovered with bringing back the body? Has there ever been an obligate dung beetle? I, I saw that there were several different dung beetles there, but is there anyone in particular that would be like the bison dung beetle? Yeah, I had that question. Uh, I posed that same question to a person in southern Saskatchewan, Dr. Kevin Fuller. He's probably North America's dung beetle expert. And he has a number. Because during that time period when the bison were being yeah, extirpated, yeah, where did they go? <laughs> where did they go? And yeah. nobody knows whether or not dung beetles that were in the billions went extinct or not. Yeah. It's all Primarily, all of the dung beetles that are active in dung today are European, limited to four or five species. There are still native dung beetles. They're primarily down south in, in the states where the witches don't live in them as much. Second question was um, considering how fantastic of an ecological keystone species they are. Um, I think of places like Kananaskis, you know, like Santa Nat area where cattle ranchers put their, their cattle in there every year. And I will make a confession, I'm, I'm a wildlife biologist myself. And I've worked a lot with Dr. Rooksville and, and Newhouse who studied the vapor sheep and, mm -hmm. and the grounds grow out there. And, um, you know, they see a fair amount of competition with the cattle and the, and the sheep. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm curious because it is a, it's a park area and I know it's provincial parks. But I'm wondering, you know, if there has been any discussion of there being instead of sort of letting this widespread grazing happen with cattle ranchers, if there's been any proposals to put bison in that region in the provincial park. Not that I know. Not you know. Okay. Um, and then just to build on that, your mm -hmm. point about cattle, um, a lot of people think that cattle can be served so they produce a dunk out this again in many mm -hmm. ways. The difference is that in most bison populations are not treated with dewormers. Yeah. Every cow that goes on into the forest is your examining cattle, all down the eastern slopes. They're treated with ivermectin before you go. Yeah. Yeah. And ivermectin continues to kill insects for up to three months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, well, and even now with the, the scare of, of chronic wasting disease, which there's been a lot of studies that have shown that they, they actually can survive it. There's a lot of them that can survive it. So it might not be as you know, as crazy of it, as scary as everybody thinks it is, but their immediate go to right now in this province, for example, is, is killing them. So that's killing them, sheep and other things. Um, Just to expand on your question, there is a, I don't know how public this is, uh, a movement with Waterton Lakes National Park and the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana to establish a transboundary bison that is going to be able to freely move from Montana up into and from using rough there yeah. water. Well, that would be, if that happened, that would be a tremendous that would advance be. in the Boston ecology. That would be wonderful. And would that involve also some of the Epsina people down? Yeah. Good. Okay. Now, uh, last question. Um, my species that, that I studied to graduate work on is the yellow belly marmot in southern Alberta. Okay. And um, I did a lot of my work on that on a very beautiful ranch right beside Ray Home Park. And uh, I, I also have indigenous heritage. So, for me, spending time there has been just, it was incredible because there was talk about ancient memories, but 
you know, I did watch the cattle kind of come, you know, do their rounds or daily rounds and whatnot. And they, you know, the, these are large ranch lands down there, so they can go off fairly far and then come back. And I wondered about these questions as, you know, what would it be like to see bison on there instead? And, and it seems like the, the biggest barrier is people almost being afraid to put, put them on the landscape because, you know, they're a large animal that's not an easy one to manage necessarily. So my question would be, um, how how do you sort of, are, I'm assuming that they're they're still, you know, to a certain degree, they're fenced and then they're, are, they're moving them from patches to patches and then just sort of yeah. moving them around and that's how it works. It depends upon the size of the operation. Yeah. Um, most medium to small size operations, they, they, they rotational graze using yeah. fences. Yeah. The bigger operations, there's none in Canada, yeah. um, but there are in the U.S. They don't have internal fencing. They let the bison do exactly what they're doing in grasslands, yeah, establishing right. their own seasonal migration patterns. I would love to see that down there, right yeah. next down there, because it would be really quite fantastic. And it was interesting that what's happening with the prairie dogs, and when you're talking about, you know, that they hate the long grass, I experienced that firsthand, even with where I was studying the yellow-bellied marmots. Um, and this is a, the, the prairie drill, the well, version of them. So most people think they live high mountains, but that there are some that live in the prairie and some over in southern British Columbia. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was the first to study them. But what I did find is um, when they actually shut down their cattle operation, where they were they were allowing them to sort of pen in this one area where one of the main colonies was, the, the marmots were taking off. They were disappearing because mm -hmm. The predators that I that I witnessed there a lot were again it was the coyotes and the badgers and there was a lot of rattlesnakes too. I even have a couple of examples where you know I had um, rattlesnake predations of little pups, yeah, mm -hmm. little tiny pups. So, cool. Yeah, so interesting. This this is to me such incredible work on so many levels, mm -hmm. and I, I just have to say thank you so much um, mm -hmm. for her sharing this information and and I really mm -hmm. really hope that more people catch on to this because I think it's wonderful. You made a comment, I think, that cattle are are good for the ecosystem. Is that they can be if they're manageable. And then but the grazing habits or patterns are different, is that right? They're quite a bit different. So when they were taken when the cattle were taken off grasslands, national park, the ecosystem deteriorated and then it became less heterogeneous when they put the bison back out. Mm -hmm. In spite of that difference in grazing habitat. Because they're cattle. Cattle ranchers were forcibly moved. Okay. Grass was cash for these people, and you know, yeah. they, many producers in it for, for money. Yeah. So they maximized their production yeah. based upon grass mm -hmm. ranching. Just west of Calgary, in um, in the park, the provincial park, that they just put a coffin. They're running cattle in there. Is that to replicate what the bison were doing when they were grazing? You know, when the herds of grazing going through there? And they, they, they seasonally and oh. intensely graze. It, it, it may, I don't know if they formed the thought that I'm putting cattle there to replicate bison, but they're putting their cattle in to manage the grass. Okay. Mm -hmm. Strong mm -hmm. Yes. What uh, part have First Nations people played in the rehabilitation? You mentioned the one in Mr. Montana. Is that the same as the one? Yeah. The part that they've been involved in uh, managing uh, First Nations are in a real bad role these days, both in Canada and the US, to get bison back on their land. Joanna mm -hmm. um, yeah. and I were instrumental in bringing bison back to the blood reserve in southern Saskatchewan. Right. They just have their first cow born there just mm -hmm. like today. <laughs> It's nice to see native folks bringing bison back. And it's happening. Elk Island National Park has been a leading factor for the bison population for decades. And just in the last probably five years, they put bison on to upwards of 25 different First Nations. In the U.S., it's just going full blown. Massive um, interest in getting bison back. Mm -hmm. Yellowstone National Park and follow their story every spring or every winter. These massive slaughters that they're doing, they shot 3,500 into this winter alone to bring the population down to 5,000. They've also got a capture and, and disease testing program where they bring animals in to a holding facility. Because they have brucellosis, they can't just then ship them off. They have to test and retest, slaughter those that test positive and keep the ones that don't. 
Well, ones that don't go to a, a reserve in northeastern Montana, on Fort Belton, and where they're kept, and then they partition them out to a whole host of different Indian reserves in Canada and the US. And some of them also have now ended up in Canada. And I work on a project to bring bison back to a place called Wanuskegon Heritage Park, mm -hmm. just outside of Saskatoon. And they now have a herd there. But they've also got a genetic from the old point of view about transfer things. Mm -hmm. It's really quite nice to see genetics coming north while we've been a case of getting in from the south. I got another one. On a slightly different note, when you're hiking in bison country at the Nelkaya National Park, how do you hike it? I, I'm worried about it when I go walking or hiking. Well, can you yeah. talk about it? Yeah. Um, Elk Island is a bit different. In, in grasslands, uh, it's easier because it wasn't visible from the long mm -hmm. um, And we always tell people uh, this rule of thumb. Uh, I tested cattle and bison. If you hold your thumb <laughs> up arm's length, uh, a bison is obscured by your thumb about 100 feet or 100 yards from you. If you can see bison stick out on either side, then you've reached a point where you're perhaps getting a little too close. Yeah. In Elk Island National Park, because it's forested, and you don't have that opportunity to see them from a long ways off. And, and we both run into occasions where we had to detour around and go through the forest to get, get past the herd. But in having bison been in Elk Island since 1907, and we've never been a person killed by bison yet. The only people who've been injured are people who get needed to be cleaned up out of the gene for a bit. An innocent biker has never been killed. Yeah. So it's actually a pretty safe thing. Bikers, the same thing. No bikes are worse. But same thing in the park. I mean, yes, they're worse, but nobody's been. There have been people, Joanne has been uh, chased off her bike. Okay. Me. I'm too fat and these are the only bikes, so don't do that. <laughs> the bicycles travel so fast and so quiet. Why doesn't have three zones of awareness and knowledge? Yeah. The first is this awareness zone. All species have it. You and I have it. We walk into an elevator, and we're very aware of our personal space. And why doesn't have one that's very large? They, they have this reputation of having poor bison. They don't, they have tremendous bison. They can see movement from miles away, mm -hmm. but they don't have a good bison for detecting a stationary objects. So you'll be sitting along the side of the trail, and unless they smell you, they might not even see you, and we'll just walk on by. Mm -hmm. If you penetrate that awareness zone, either on foot or on bicycle, or wherever you're traveling, you'll see one or more members of the group lift their heads and focus on. Mm -hmm. So they're, now they're, they're deep into their, well, you're just penetrating their flight of fights. Mm -hmm. And they have to, at that point, make a decision as to whether you're a threat or a grenade, you're just a, an idiot out for walk. <laughs> if you continue to walk towards them, then you pass through that zone and you're into their fight zone mm -hmm. or they're deep into their flight zone. And there they have to make a really conscious decision do I run or do I fight? Mm -hmm. uh, and once people are getting injured, and those who penetrate deep into that zone too fast to allow that clock to click fast enough to make a decision in the bison brain. So I always tell people when you're approaching a herd of bison or an individual on a hiking trail, take your time, make sure that that individual knows that you're there, make noise, do something to cause them to be aware of you, and then see what he does. I was on foot in the park last week and I came across three bulls. She was in, I was in a thick patch of forest and they were just in on the edge of an opening. When I came into that opening, closer than here to the street, they were all bedded, all sleeping, but they heard me and they woke up and they instantly spun me and focused on me. And then they did their spawning and they were running off and all was good. If they hadn't done that, I would have removed myself and, and gone around. Okay, thanks. Yes. So, anyway. How much of the historic range of bison has been converted for livestock production for the millions of hectares for forage crops for cattle? Can you envision, Wes, a uh, future in which bison essentially repatriate some of that lost range and are meaningful contributors to meat production, but managed in a way that maintain all of the Ecosystem dynamics that you so wonderfully show us. Yeah, uh, it is taking place. Um, Ted Turner, he's North America's largest bison producer. He has 13 ranches ranging in size from 10,000 acres to he's got some that are 85,000 acres. Um, 
and he has the sequence. It is a farm to plate marketer. So he's got a whole series of restaurants called Montana Pets Bison Restaurant, right across the US. He has one ranch that does nothing but raise babies. Those babies are weaned and taken to another ranch where they're fed on grass. And then they're sorted to another ranch where they have bread and heifers and milk. And all the bulls go to another ranch where they're raised for meat. And all that meat then goes into the, to his restaurant chain. But all of those ranches are large enough in scale that they're fully functioning meat business. And he and his son have a return foundation. They're heavily involved in endangered species restoration across each of the branches. If there's an endangered species that they can support by protecting it on the ranches, they're doing it. So that's the massive scale. In Saskatchewan right now, there's a move to just south of Cypress Hills in Saskatchewan, there's a place called the Gulfmark Community Pasture. It's one of the former PFRA cattle grazing pastures. Are you familiar with PFRA pastures? Mm -hmm. uh, PFRA stands for Prairie Farm Rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It was enacted, it was enacted in the 1930s as a way to keep producers on the landscape. And at that time, there was somebody on almost every quarter section in the southern prairies. And when the dirty 30s hit, they were walking away from it and couldn't make a living. So the federal government stepped in and created these massive uh, PFRA pastures. They're some of them bigger than grasslands, uh, where these original ranchers could bring their flock. Uh, they'd hire a team of cowboys to look after them for the summer. And then you go back over to the farms in the winter. Uh, Going on community pastures actually owned by Parks Canada. Uh, in, during the 1930s, it was Antelope National Park. Mm -hmm. And there's a movement now since the collapse of the federal government terminated the PFRA program three or four years ago. And the patrons of those ranch lines had to then manage it themselves rather than having government cowboys do the portal. And so the government pasture, there's a move to switch it from cattle to bison, run by First Nations. And so if there's a First Nations in Canada that wants to have a large herd of bison but don't have the space on the small reserve, mm -hmm. they'll amalgamate all those animals onto the government pasture and operate it much like Grasslands National Park. Mm -hmm. What with the food sovereignty you know, target in mind, raising meat to feed to you know, school children and elders on the reserves. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's just a bad out program. And it also will act like Grasslands National Park and be fully an ecosystem function. Mm -hmm. None of the smaller places are big enough to really on all that. I think that's a, a really good point. I think we've seen an Alberta since Biden came back, especially with small operators. Is it's there's often this tendency to, to manage them as intensively as a cow. Mm -hmm. And very quickly. We can lose the benefits that you've shown us tonight. Um, I mean, you have to let bison be bison. If you want to turn them into cows, exactly. the benefits often disappear too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. How's the bat bird doing? That bird is doing amazing. Um, we took 16 animals there, 10 red females and six bulls uh, in February of 2017. Those animals were all selected based on their genetics. They did everything they could to ensure that none of the individuals were related to each other. And there's a high enough number of <clears throat> all national park birds that run on a 50-50 male to female ratio, unlike a farm where it's usually one bull with 25 cows or something. So their genetic diversity in the source herd um, is excellent. These ones came from grasslands. No, um, so there's enough genetic diversity there that they're pretty sure that the fetuses were not related to other fetuses. Um, it's a very small farming population. Um, they were held in confinement in a holding pen for two years uh, through two successful calving seasons because of where they calved it, they decided it's home. Um, if you just kick them out on the landscape, they'll attract them back to where they came. So they had two successful calving seasons in the holding pen. And then the gates were taken down and they were just allowed to eat bison on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Those 16 animals have now increased to about 90 in the landscape. And they're doing very well. Mm -hmm. adapted to the, the terrain and vegetation remarkably well. They're doing things that nobody expected them to do. Mm -hmm. Summering up in the high elevation meadow systems, wintering back where they held during the winter months, and getting to learn that landscape. Three of the bulls still left the park, and went east out towards the Yohan Ranch. 
One of them, they were able to tranquilize and they put them down to Waterton. The other two were completely inaccessible places and they were headed east and into the cattle, into the eastern edges of the forest reserve. So they used the nice those. They couldn't even get in there to get the meat up there. So they were donated to the lion's group. Now, there's been a couple attempts by the main herd to leave the park, but every drainage that leaves the park to the east is fenced. And with a rudimentary fence that is good enough to turn bison back, but allows all the other animals to model to move freely through. And there was a group of people called the um, all attended kind of stewards or something like that, you know, riders who recreate up there anyway, uh, are tasked with looking for and finding sign of bison that may have left it there. Then they'll go in and actually try to find them and piece them back in. So this one they're doing very well. There was initially a, a five years pilot project where if there was a major screw up, they all left and, and all ended up on the main street event. Um, program would be shut down. They survived that and they're mm -hmm. now they're no different management wise than the missing bear. Don't they split up into smaller herds? No. Well, I shouldn't say that. Yes. Um, the metal system during the winter months it can be small enough that it won't sustain all 90 animals. And it's typical that they break into knocking out the groups. A lead cow with her cohort that surrounds her. And they'll split temporarily, but they'll come back together again. Then they'll split in different groups. And so it's constantly evolving. The bulls, they're the exporters, they're the ones that go out and seek out new habitats. And they come back and maybe bring the cows to them. So, yeah, they're doing everything the bison do. How do they interact with the bears? How do they interact with the bears? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. We, the park interpreters and biologists wanted to know that answer. So they made a, a life size wooden cutout of the bison, three dimensional, <laughs> and put it out on the landscape with trail cameras pointed at And every animal would walk by there and stand up and look at this thing. And, um, then go over to investigate it, get photographs of the grizzly swatting at it. Uh, to date, though, they, they think there's only been one calf lost to predation and likely wolves. Um, but they can't even say that for sure. The captors disappeared from the group. But how do they um, split the uh, the space between them? Pardon me. How do they split the up the space? Well, they're constantly interacting. Bears are moving through the bison groups and birds are walking back. And they're okay. We can all the time. Ah. And so they're sharing space and time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do many of the bulls get to breed, or is the kind of one top bull that Question. impregnates most of them? Um, in case you didn't hear, does every bull get the chance to breed? Uh, they're given equal opportunity, but not every bull breeds. Um, we did a paternity study in Alcon where we collected DNA from every animal in the park, and then we were able to genetically trace back which sire is the father of which animal. Uh, and this they reported in other populations as well. But on average, the bull only breeds three cows per year. So they're both the breeding behavior is such that they'll spend days, weeks sometimes, pending cows are coming into heat. The dukes are spent time pending that they don't have to do this breeding. And then there's the, they call them sneaker bulls. Bulls that were, in El Congo, we had one bull bred 23 calves <laughs> three years ago. Produced from the two cats. So I wanted to know what was different from him. Was he a bigger, long, really aggressive bull? And so we put tags on him so I could follow him around and winter through the breeding season to see who was not uh, And he was a secret. He was a neat, mild, subordinate bull that um, would never get involved in a fight. I mean, two bulls battling over the cow over here, and he agreed to one that he fighting. <laughs> One of the bulls that we planted, probably a third, uh, were not fertile. Mm -hmm. They don't breed typically until they're eight to twelve years of age. Mm -hmm. So those males that dispersed, were they how old were they? Four. They're the ones that bulls stay with the cow calf herd, and they look like cows mm -hmm. uh, until they're third, the end of the third summer, mm -hmm. and then their hair color changes and they look like bulls. Mm -hmm. That's an anti-predator strategy. Because you don't want to be different than everybody else. Yeah. You, you want to be the same. And so when they switch from looking like cows to looking like bulls, they leave the cow calf herd when they form bull years. And then those young bachelor groups will stay together, big old bulls, hungry, want nothing to do with girls anymore. They just go off and hang out with the food. 
Yeah. And then with those sneaker bowl bo bo bowls mixtures, or were they were they male looking? Oh, they were male. Looking. Yeah. <laughs> and it was also the first summer that they reached the point where they thought they could do And that's the point where they go off this first thing looking for other birds. Yeah. So the, the, the bison, uh, if I recall correctly from your presentation, were, were reduced to 36 animals. 23. Or 23. So um, are they now genetically diverse? I don't know much about genetics. How does that work? Actually, I, I'll back up. 23 wild bison were left in Yellowstone. But at the same time, there were bison on farms and ranches and zoos. So I went back to all the records I could find to find out the answer to that question. What is the original genetic base of today's population? And it's 84 animals. Um, but they were captured from all over the US and Canada and then put into captive breeding facilities and farms and ranches. Um, in, in addition to the 23 Yellowstone, all bison and thanks by the North America and uh, older origin to 109 animals. So the question is, is yours, how diverse are they? How much should we keep or how much should we lose? And there's a whole swack of work going on right now. DNA technology has improved so much that you know, they're able now to take a drop. I didn't know her and tell them if it was a male or a female, was she pregnant? Was she stressed? What did she eat? Where, where did she come from? Tremendous advances in DNA. Part of that is looking at ancient DNA and bones and tissue and whatnot that was salvaged or collected. And, well, there were still 30 million bison in the landscape and comparing it to the genetics of the animals that are alive today. And so far, it looks like we captured almost all of the original DNA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's still ongoing. They don't know much about the historic wood bison and population because they don't have much ancient DNA to, to look at. Yeah. And there's a big research project right now going across yeah. northern Alberta trying to find old you know, wood bison. Mm -hmm. And what is the fundamental difference between the two species? Could you pass this light? Difference? Wood, uh, wood bison males average something like 2,500 pounds. Next one. Plains buffalo males average about 2,000 pounds. Yeah. It's a, a bigger, much more aggressive animal, the, the wood bison. Actually, the wood bison live in smaller groups, i.e. thanks to semi-forested environment that they're all in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the competition between males within a, a group of 35 animals is considerably more than among 300 bull plains buffalo in a herd of 3,000. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I, I might have to disagree slightly. Pardon? I, I might have to disagree just a little bit with you. Well, and I'll explain why. Um, here's a classic plains bison bull. Yes. Classic plains bison bull. These guys evolved on the opening plains of North America, where you can be seen from a tremendous distance in massive herds, like you say, of tens of thousands during the breeding year. Mm -hmm. So, for a breeding age male to outcompete all those other breeding age males, he has to first exert his dominance through physical display. Mm -hmm. So, all of his hair coat characteristics are exaggerated in size. It's like the breeding plumage of a bird in the spring. And, and all of that is designed to make him look bigger as a threat to his rivals. In the event that he can't out bluff them physically, that's when they get into the battles. Mm -hmm. And at least the highest point of his hump is set over the front legs, and that's an adaptation to fighting. Mm -hmm. But it also gives them a balance point perfect for traveling long distances. Mm -hmm. and it gives them what's known as a cursorial gait. They have a short Air all virtually naked from shoulders back. And that's a thermal window that allows them to radiate excess body heat during hot summers on the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. uh, is there another slide after this? Yeah. So there's a classic wood bison. Uh, and you're right that the wood bison uh, in Elk Island, they'll often reach 2,400 pounds for an adult male. 2,600 pounds was the largest. Plains bison typically, the biggest plains bison ever weighed was 1,800 pounds. Mm -hmm. And they've got weights going back tens of thousands of times of the weight bison. Mm -hmm. These guys, as you said, lived in small herds in the north and small meadow systems. And the difference is that these guys, as you, as you mentioned, know each other. 
because they spend time together in small groups. So they don't need to go through that whole rigorous battle and blanketing and do when they encounter strangers. We've all already settled them. Mm -hmm. I'm bigger than you. It still takes place during the rough. Mm -hmm. But I did a study looking at uh, which is more aggressive uh, yeah. with to themselves, you know, kind of, because they're got both types. Mm -hmm. And I did that by looking at injury rates. In place wise, in North Highway 16, we lost between two to five percent of our breeding age males every year from rock related injuries. Mm -hmm. We didn't lose a single wood bison bull to rock related mm -hmm. injuries. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just much gentler bull. I did a study looking at vocalizations uh, in the roars that they create. Just Google bison bellowing sometimes and you can hear sounds that they make. Um, wood bison have a much lower repertoire of sound because the sound is intended for pers interpersonal contact, not for traveling vast distances in open space. Mm -hmm. Wood bison have this uh, sound, it's almost like a Deep bass purring sound that a cat would make. Mm -hmm. You can't hear it, you hear the door. Mm -hmm. If you're in a truck and you're closer, and that bull is standing the cow, he's purring to her. Would a place wise and never do that. Mm -hmm. It's all aggression with the bass. Mm -hmm. I looked at differences in wallowing behavior because aggression is a wallowing is a form of aggression between males. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the wallow density north of Highway 16, where the place was in our, was you know, 15 walls per hectare. South of the highway with the wood bison, it was 0 0.01 walls for every massive differences in their behavior from an aggression point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, I'll uh, I'll take one more question if there's one more after that. Um, I was wondering about the patch grazing. Is that with all grasses, all native grasses and leases, or is it specifically like the native cascades that they normally eat during the winter? Uh, what was the first part of that? Um, for the patch grazing that you told oh, Yeah, no, it's all grasses. All native grass. Okay. It's different with uh, agronomic grasses, Kentucky bluegrass, uh, because it doesn't function the same as native grass we need to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But definitely on plants, it's patch grazing cause money. Okay. And then another question. Um, <laughs> Do you, or is there any research done showing that the bison grazing and the effects on the grassland biodiversity uh, affects how invasives come in? Because they're obviously dispersing invasive species as well, but it's a more resilient ecosystem. So. Um, there's been a lot of work looking at that, especially in the states. Um, and today, no, I don't think so, because well, it certainly takes place on high intensity grazing conditions mm -hmm. where the bison are overstocked due to human management. If they're left, left to their own looking grass on through the cut off space, there's been no increase in invasive species. Mm -hmm. Mostly because the grasslands are healthier and they can only compete those invasive plants. Yeah, they are. Okay. So it's really just um, cultivated. Yeah. Okay. Is that the same with like cattle then as well? Because you say cattle. No, because the producers of cattle manipulate their grazing to the point where. Yeah. They maximize grass consumption yeah. uh, and create situations where the invasive plant can move in. All the native, all the invasive plants that uh, grassland is dealing with right now are relics of the cattle grazing history. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody.